Well, hello there and welcome, or should I say, howdy there, partner. Welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today we are going down Night Fighter Row, which will probably cover the end, Greg, the end and the last of the Night Fighters, the P-82 or the F-82, depending on what part of the introduction you're talking about, but this was the end of the line for night fighters and why, Greg, you say why. The reason why my Franian assistant is that uh, after this, we were going to all weather fighters. And, you know, they were screwing around with the Scorpion and some other of those early war jets, but they were going all weather, all radar because of the Cold War. So uh, we were getting away from purpose-built aircraft more to kind of Swiss Army knife airplanes. But first, you can tell I am way hop along Cassidy today with a Greg what, what, Mustang. Mustang. <laughs> Just got it. Like I'm not qu quick on the uptake there. So I'm going to throw this uh, off camera here. This thing has no mass. So we'll see. Oh, there you go. Greg got it, which is a good thing. Of course, we are talking about this F-82. Now, specifically, we are talking about the night fighter version of the airplane, which is obviously by this giant uh, protrusion in the center of the aircraft, which, by the way, also made it an all-weather airplane at the time, but I'll throw up a plan view. This thing is, is big, even as a model. It's ungainly to handle, but... There, this aircraft, its first flight was in 1945. It, it was introduced in 1946. Had a very short shelf life because we're talking about the end of uh, piston engine airplanes with the exception of ground attack. Uh, and even they were pretty much gone by about 1955. This aircraft went out to pasture in 1953, if you can believe that, so very short, short shelf life, and they built 272 of them uh, before they went into history. Now, Greg, the interesting thing about this is this was originally designed, you know what it was designed for, Greg? It was designed as a long-range escort for B-29s and it never made it into production uh, fast enough with the B-29. It did, however, make it into the next conflict, as did a lot of Mustangs, Corsairs, aircraft as ground attack. Now, this thing, because it had radar, it had two pilots, it had incredible range, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, it did end up in the skies. It was one of the first aircraft, very fast, by the way, uh, 400, uh, 461 miles an hour is a cruising speed, maybe a little bit faster. But it, um, th it made it into the skies over Korea uh, before anything else. It was flying both uh, escort and uh, some ground attack, if you want to call it that. And it uh, actually had the first three North Korean aircraft shot down, were shot down by F-82s by the United States. So the first three kills, aerial victories, were made by this aircraft, which is, is kind of interesting. Now, the design philosophy behind this airplane was quite simple. They needed a fast fighter that could go over 2,000 miles, because remember, at that time with the B-29, we were making a lot of overwater flights from Tinian and, and places like that with B-29s. B-29s had no problem with range, but they wanted a fast fighter to be able to stay with them. So that was the original thought of the design. It is very similar. We'll see if you can find one of these, Greg. Here's a very Fred fun fact-ish kind of thing there, which is, don't say that fast, by the way, uh, a BF-109Z, the z -Wing. Find the Z model uh, BF-109, uh, ME-109, and you will see something very interesting. This type of design is not unique. So you would think, Greg, you would think, I am standing in front of a P-51. Now it is quite simple. This is Bunny. You can see that 
Rolls Royce sitting up there. Now you would think that what they would that they did was they basically just put a wing in there, right? Join them together. Nay, 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 my friend. Actually, behind the cockpit, they lengthened the fuselage by 57 inches. So there's actually a plug in here that actually stretched this out. The fuselages are based on the P-51H, which was the apex predator of the day of this particular aircraft. Also, the dorsal is higher, is taller. So those changes really were made to the fuselage. The center section obviously joined together. Now this could be two pilots. Kind of a lonely thing though. Don't you think they could have put like a bathroom in there or something? Can you imagine you sticking these two guys in the fuselage and kind of wave at each other? There's no microwave, you're stuck up there, you're flying around. The thing can fly forever, but you're stuck in a P-51 cockpit. It's a little, little narrow, but the, um, it could also be in the night fighter version that we're talking about, it was a radar operator. So they, they had um, two functions to do that. Now in the air superiority role, this thing, as I said, was pretty wicked over North Korea. It never saw combat. It came too late for World War II, but it, but it was dominant. And it did a lot of work in North Korea. It also uh, ended up in Alaska with Strategic Air Command because up to that point, well, remember, Needed an all-weather fighter, we didn't have it at that time. And what were the Russians doing in the Cold War? They were pushing that NORAD air defense all up in Alaska, and so they would put these up there. They put these up there in a very short transition until they got to an all-weather aircraft uh, as the all-weather interceptor. So they flew interceptors out there. They did other things up in Alaska as well, but that was primarily uh, what they were laid out for. Now, interesting, thing about this aircraft is on the when they built the prototype and you know you have counter rotating props right and so the props would would rotate to, let's say towards each other at the top right when they rotated at the top when they initially tried to get the prototype in the air what ended up happening was now what would you would you think happened no problem right you got all this power the rotation of the prop at the top of the rotation canceled out all the lift of the center section and they could not get the airplane off the ground. Fred, fun fact, the North American engineers screwed around with that for some time and they realized that if they changed the prop direction and had them rotate and meet at the bottom, that that solved the lift problem. Think about, and, and isn't that how interesting just the nuance of the airplane can be. Something that simple that you would think wouldn't have any issue at all, but they finally realized that the way the props rotated was canceling out all that lift in the center section. Obviously, this isn't gonna cut it. Now, if, it, if the airplane had got off the ground, even if it had got off the ground, think about the fact that it, what it could have carried from a standpoint of being fully loaded if they had managed to actually get the airplane flying. So in many ways, it's good that it never made it into the air that way because it was a, a major uh, aerodynamic flaw. So my salute today, as I put the Midnight Sinner, this is definitely a night fighter, Greg, the Midnight Sinner back on its little perch here is if you were a, you flew one of these, you were in a very narrow club because they had only 272 of them. And as I said, you were holding the line right at the beginning of the Cold War, both in North Korea and the Korean War, and then up on the Alaskan Peninsula. So I am going to salute all these air crews today, and I'm gonna do it with, Craig, I, I never see this until this is like the show. This is probably one of the nastiest you've ever seen given me, this is Gross Gus's, thank you Gross Gus, his Pimple Pop Soda. I don't, I, I told you, I don't even know if I can drink this. This is pretty bad. Uh, established 1985, Marshmallow Soda. Oh boy. Um, a California cash refund, fairly new as we've learned in my 
days with uh, Greg and his strange soda choices, bottled in Indian by Indian Wells Brewing Company. This is close to home, just up the street uh, in your Kern, California. So somebody in Indian Wells had the brilliant idea to do this. Well, let's see if I can get a hold of it here. Well, maybe get say up oh, there because there was a slight fizz, not a good one, Greg. This is a bad one. Yeah, even Greg is showing a little fear here. Uh, it's nasty. Now, if you were in the very rare cadre that flew the P or the F-82, uh, you're in rare air. And as I said, you were defending the United States at a very uncertain time. Also, within a very uncertain world, in terms of what was happening with aviation. Think about this from a standpoint of in this land, the P-80, so you had some of the Lockheed, early Lockheed stuff coming in. Uh, you had the, the P or the F-84. Uh, the, all that stuff was coming in, but it was really unproven technology and actually pretty darn dangerous to fly. This thing though, this was, as I, I've talked about an apex predator before. This is about a uh, a apex predator ish as you could get the end of the line for the type and one of the top of the line th these are being restored uh, and uh, I've seen video of one of them flying hopefully someday I can actually see one of them flying around but if you were one of the folks that did this God bless you and I salute you this uh It's definitely marshmallow-y. Marshmallow I can't even look at the label when I'm doing this. It's just so bad. Okay, well, you notice I took two brief swigs of that. That was, that's gross. That's just gross. So if you were defending our nation at that time and you were in this type of aircraft, you were in very rare air. But... It's interesting, although they weren't built, there were not a lot of them built, it was the perfect weapon for that time. We needed an all-weather interceptor, and this worked. And it also had the range to stay over those targets in Korea, which also, if you think about it at the time, who would have thought in 1946 that we'd be back in Korea at that time? So thank you very much. Our country owes you a debt of gratitude. Now, this particular aircraft, um, it was the, this is the night fighter version, which had had this uh, very long protrusion there at the beginning. And that was an AN APG 28 radar. As I said, there was a pilot and a radar operator in this airplane, and it was very, very effective. Uh, it also has the distinction, this type of aircraft has the distinction that this is the longest nonstop flight ever made by a piston engine fighter um, that was 14 hours, a little bit long, and it was uh, f over 5,000 miles, 5,051 miles, 14 hours. It was also the fastest flight ever at 347.5 miles per hour, but who's counting the 0.5, right? So, uh, so it was a world record holder as well. That record, Greg, still stands to this day. Nothing has ever beaten that record, and I doubt that that will ever happen. That record is going to stand, but good old Robert Thacker did that. And uh, Robert, we, uh, we saluted the folks who flew it. We also salute you because that is a major feat uh, in staying in that airplane for 14 hours. Uh, as I said, a Mustang cockpit is not something I would want to be in a, for 14 hours, but what the heck. Now, if you want to be a Mustang aficionado yourself, you can go out and the link that we have attached to this, you can click on that link and get yourself a good old Mustang shirt, become part of the team. Get yourself a D model shirt, so click on that. Jason will happily pull your size, run down to the store and get this off to you. Now we cannot do what we do. You can see we've got the cowling off on this bad boy and the reality is this is getting ready to have a heads and bank torque. Those of you in the comment can tell me what that means when they're going to go in and torque, actually torque the valves 
and check the heads and banks. So uh, check that out. Tell me in the comments what I'm talking about and, and how many hours we have to do at that. Here, there's a challenge. How many hours do we have to do that? Uh, but we cannot do this stuff without your generous donation. So click on the link to send us a few bucks. We can use it. If you came across us on YouTube, we can use your subscription. If you can handle uh, long form aviation videos and the completely disgusting drinks that Greg finds for me in the hats, send us to a friend that likes uh, aircraft. Hopefully you can get past that as well. Give us a subscription and a thumbs up. If you saw us on Facebook, we can also use your help on Facebook with a like and a comment. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks so much. Have a great day.